Well, our text this morning is re <coughs> relatively short, but the subject, as I've already said, is a rather large subject, as all of them tend to be, um, especially as they've been studied by the church for so many years. Uh, but let's read the text, um, Luke chapter 13, verses 18 through um, uh, 20, 22, and we're really going to be focusing mainly on verses 18 through 21, because 22 basically tells us that Jesus uh, was continuing to proceed on his way to Jerusalem. So I think we've already noted that before, that this particular time in Jesus' life, he is heading towards Jerusalem. So he is preparing to lay down his life for his sheep. Um, anyway, so let's read this, uh, this other part of the text, the two parables. Beginning in verse 18, so he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and threw into his own garden. And it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. And again he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Now let me just say at the outset that for those of you who have been here for for very long. We, we have actually gone through in the past Matthew's gospel, and we've gone through Mark's gospel, and we know that um, uh, Matthew and Mark both contain that first parable, and Matthew contains the second. So we have seen this before, and I, you may have uh, at least remember what, how we've looked at it before. But um, for those of you who haven't, then this will be uh, perhaps fresh ground. But Jesus is talking here about the kingdom of heaven and how it progresses and what kind of an influence it's going to exert in the world. And again, Jesus, as we know, used parables to teach his disciples truth and yet hid it from those that uh, were unbelieving. But what we want to see is what would this have meant to the disciples and why did Jesus speak it to them um, on this particular occasion. Now, last week we saw Jesus uh, ministering the gospel in one of the synagogues of Galilee, remember, where he saw a woman who had been bound by a demon for 18 years. Basically, she was doubled over, and she couldn't straighten up. In his compassion, Jesus called her, laid his hands on her, and he freed her from this bondage. Now, the synagogue official, instead of glorifying God as the woman was glorifying God and the many others who saw this miracle, he objected. He says in verse 14, there are six days in which work should be done, so come on them and get healed and not on the Sabbath day. Well, Jesus, in response to this, said that he, as well as the others who agreed with him, were essentially hypocrites. Would they show mercy to their ox or their donkey, uh, untying them and leading them away to feed them and to water them, and not show mercy to this daughter of Abraham? Jesus reminded them that the Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was made for us. God intends it to be a blessing to us. He wants us to rest on this day. He wants us to spend time with him on this day. And as we have opportunity, he wants us to help those who are in need. The Lord has not tied us up on this day so we can't do the things that are essential, things that are necessary, and things that are acts of mercy. But God wants us to guard this day jealously because he loves us and wants to spend time with us. And certainly if we love him, that's what we want to do as well. We love this day for that reason. Now this morning, Jesus sets out to correct another one of their misunderstandings, one that wasn't just among the Jews in, in general, but also among his disciples that had to do with God's kingdom. Now these are two of what we call the kingdom parables. Jesus, uh, parables that Jesus taught his disciples to show them what the kingdom of God would be like. Now, the disciples, like all the Jews, and I, we, we have heard this recently, believed that Messiah had come to reestablish the Davidic kingdom. You know, he's David's son. He's going to sit on David's throne. They believed that he was a political Messiah and that when he took power, was going to act very quickly to fight against and to overcome and to lead them to victory over the Romans. Okay, again, political Messiah going to deliver us from the tyranny of Rome. 
But they also believed essentially this kingdom was going to be confined to Palestine, to the land that God had promised to, to Abraham, and that Jesus essentially was going to sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem, ruling over this area which was now under Roman rule. Now over against this, Jesus is telling them two things. He's telling them, first of all, that this kingdom isn't going to come quickly and suddenly. It was something that began small, and it was progressively going to fill the entire earth, and that's not something that would happen very quickly. And secondly, that it wouldn't be confined just to Palestine, but it was a kingdom that was eventually going to exercise its influence over the entire world. So let's look at these two points uh, this morning. First of all, he says the kingdom would begin small and progressively, eventually fill the entire earth. He says the kingdom is like a seed, a very small seed. It grows into a large tree. He says it's like leaven that um, is introduced into this flower and it eventually works its way all the way through until the whole of it is leavened. So something that starts small but progressively grows larger. Now Jesus uses a mustard seed to represent his kingdom. It is, as he says in Mark's gospel, a very small seed, the smallest seed of all the garden seeds. And as I've already mentioned, leaven is also proportionally small compared to the influence that it's going to exert in the flower into which it's sown. Well, this is how the kingdom of heaven begins. It begins very small. I think we see that, by the way, uh, Jesus may have been uh, referring primarily to how it was going to advance from his point onward, but we do need to understand the kingdom of heaven has always been relatively small. Remember that uh, in the beginning it was confined to one family, certainly Adam and Eve's, and then it branched off into Seth's family. Uh, It narrowed down to Noah's at the time of the flood. Only Noah and his family came through. They were the only ones who survived. But then of the three children, it was narrowed to Shem's family. Abraham came from Shem, and then, of course, Isaac and Jacob, and there's others in in between, of course, uh, between Seth to Noah and uh, Shem to Abraham. But even at the time of Jacob, when Abraham's family began to grow and the people of Israel became millions, right, there were still only very few who believed. Uh, The northern kingdom at one time became so corrupt that the Lord said to Elijah when he thought he was the only faithful Israelite left that he had reserved 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal. But what's 7,000 among the millions of Israelites living in the northern kingdom. And so as we progress even further through time, you know, after the, the, the exile and then after the exile, there were still just a few who trusted in the Lord. And when Jesus came, only a few that were looking for the consolation of Israel, that were even looking for the Messiah. By the end of Jesus' ministry, there were not thousands that were following him. Most of the people called out for his death, right? But there were some. There were a few, the greatest preacher who ever lived, the one anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the way, this reminds us that it takes more than just a person's having the Spirit of God to preach. It also requires the Spirit's work in the audience. And up to this point, the Lord had not uh, been pleased to say very many. The church was still relatively small. It begins small. After his ascension, there were 120 who gathered together to pray for, for what the Father had promised to give through Jesus the Holy Spirit, 120, not very many after three and a half years of ministry of our Lord, but after Pentecost, okay, it began to grow. 3,000 were converted on the day of Pentecost when Peter got up and preached. A little later on, Peter and John preached again at the healing of the lame man, and 5,000 more were brought into the kingdom. Uh, shortly after that, Jesus calls Paul, sends him to the Gentiles, And he, not single-handedly, but we'd have to say he had a great deal to do with the evangelization of the entire Roman Empire so that many more thousands were converted. We know the kingdom has continued to grow throughout the centuries. There's still many people groups that need to be reached, but I think we'd admit there's far more Christians today than there were in first century Palestine or any time before that. Now, let me just mention, first of all, that this is exactly what the Lord said was going to happen, not only our Lord Jesus in these parables, but this is what he also said would happen in the Old Testament. Uh, One of the things you might have noticed in our call to worship this morning from Psalm 72, verse 8, 
it says that the Messiah would rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. That certainly didn't happen in Jesus' day, but that is coming about in, in our day. The Lord showed Nebuchadnezzar, as we saw in that um, uh, meditation we were looking at, that Messiah's kingdom would grow to the point where it would fill the entire earth, Daniel 2.35. That stone, which is the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ that he brought and set up in the days of the kings that are basically represented by the ten toes that we believe to be Rome, that struck the statue, became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. In Mark's gospel, Jesus tells us that when this mustard seed, which is the smallest seed of the garden, is fully grown, it's larger than all the other garden plants. And the question is, well, why, why is that pointed out? It's because Jesus was teaching us here that the kingdom is going to begin small, introduced into the world, which is the garden, and eventually it would become larger than all the other kingdoms. Uh, that's what we see in Scripture. That's what we see in this parable. So it begins small, but progressively fills the entire earth. It wasn't going to come quickly, and it wasn't going to be located just in Palestine. But secondly, what's true of its size is also true of its influence. And here's the interesting point. It began small, only influencing a few souls, but it would eventually dominate the world. The birds of the air would nest in its branches, which we're going to look at in just a moment, and all the flour would eventually become leavened. By the way, this leavening of the flour is looked at in a couple of different ways. There, there are those who look at it as sort of an evil thing. Leaven is always evil, and the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. That doesn't make any sense. So we, we disregard that idea. But others take the idea that the kingdom is sown in our hearts and eventually works through the entire man, sanctifying us until we become like Jesus. And that's certainly true. But I believe Jesus really here has in mind its influence in the entire world. Now, we do understand that Jesus came into the world to do two things. He came into the world to save his people, right? To save us. He's, a, he's our Messiah. He's our Savior. The angel said to Joseph regarding Mary in Matthew 121, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. His name actually gives his, his, his work, why he was sent into the world. The name Jesus literally means Jehovah or Yahweh, the Lord is our salvation. So that's why he was called Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And we rejoice in that. But he came into the world for another reason as well. And that is that he might rule the world. Now we've already seen that, but let's look at a couple of other passages. Uh, the Lord says through Isaiah the prophet, in one of the most popular passages to read during, the, um, you know, during Christmas time, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Now, certainly we see here that he came... He came to rule. The government was to rest upon his shoulders. And we're going to see that it's more than just ruling, as it were, um, from heaven over the kingdoms of the earth with little effect. But it's going to have strong effect. And also it's going to be more extensive than just David's throne. But we do understand that that was a promise made to David. One of his sons would sit on his throne and God would establish that kingdom forever. Now, the rule of our Lord Jesus actually began after his ascension. The author to the Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 10, verse 12. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Okay? So his session, his, which is his being seated at the right hand of God, his coronation took place after he was raised from the dead, spoke to his disciples over the next 40 days, ascends into heaven on the cloud, and he is crowned king. And then we understand that the rule that he was given at that time is going to continue, as we've already seen uh, earlier in the service, until all his enemies, 
are defeated. Okay? Now, quoting Psalm 110, the author to the Hebrews again writes this. Um, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. In other words, until they are basically vanquished or conquered. Now, tie that in with what Paul says in Philippians 2, verses 7 through 11, because we often read this passage in terms of the day of judgment. And it, I'm not saying it's not possible that that is what's being referred to here, but I would just draw out the, the idea that um, uh, every knee bowing to him, that the different locations from which they're doing it would not really make sense at the end of time. But this, Paul writes this in Philippians 2, verses 7 through 11 that Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So again, we see the idea of Jesus being seated, being coronated. He's ruling. He's going to rule until all of his enemies are subdued under his feet. And we see that that's a part of his reward for the work that he has done, that one day every knee is going to bow before him, those who are in heaven, on earth, and, and under the earth. Now, the, I think we all agree on that. Certainly, we have to because that's what the Bible says. We know this is going to happen, but the question is, when is this going to take place? Um, is it going to happen as, uh, when premills, if I can use that term, premillennials, uh, when they believe it's going to happen? Remember, premillennials mean that Jesus is going to come before a thousand-year period in which um, he's going to set up that kingdom, and these things are going to take place. Um, is it going to happen when Jesus returns to set up his kingdom on earth? Is it going to happen as Amils believe, that when Jesus returns basically to bring the final judgment, and then at the judgment every knee is going to bow before him? Or is it going to happen as um, when postmillennials believe, and postmillennials believe that Jesus is going to come after the millennium, um, which is uh, before Jesus then comes at the end of time. Now, I think, again, we can all agree the most important thing is that every knee is going to bow at some point in history. Okay, that is the important thing. But I, I think there are indications in Scripture from what we've already seen that this is going to happen before Jesus Christ returns. Now, settling the question of when he returns is a really big one, so this is where I have to make some assumptions. So let me just say this. When Jesus Christ returns, and not all Christians agree on this, but when he returns, things are going to change. I think we all agree on that. But he's going to bring an end to life as we have known it up to this point. The Bible says when Jesus comes again, he's going to raise the dead. He's going to gather all the living. He's going to bring all mankind together for one final judgment. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. He's going to welcome the sheep into his kingdom, and he's going to cast the goats into the eternal fire. We call that the eternal separation, final separation. And he's going to bring, of course, before that takes place, the new heavens and the new earth. So we are going to be with him in the new heavens and the new earth if we've trusted Jesus. The wicked are going to be in the lake of fire. So there's going to be a finality when Jesus comes the second time. We've already read earlier that that's when his reign ends, when he comes the second time to conquer the last enemy, which is death, and he does that through the resurrection and the gathering. There's, there's no more death because all the dead now are living again, and all the living are gathered together, and there's going to be the final separation, so there's not going to be any, any more death. So that's when his reign ends. So the question is, where do we fit these other passages that talk about his reign being actually quite extensive, quite powerful, quite influential in this world uh, while the present heaven and earth basically are continuing. Let me read a couple of passages. The psalmist writes in Psalm 66, verses 3 and 4, Because of the greatness of your power, 
Your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. All the earth will worship you and will sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name. Notice the whole earth worshiping God while there are still enemies who are around giving feigned obedience to the Lord. Daniel writes in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, and I, I think it's interesting if we tie this vision that Daniel saw here with the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that when Jesus ascended, that was his coronation day. Remember, he ascended into heaven to be crowned king. Well, as the disciples are watching him go out of sight, it's almost as if Daniel, centuries before, was given a vision of what happens after that. This is what he says in verses 13 and 14. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So Jesus is given authority and power at that point over all the kingdoms of the earth. Now the question is, how is that going to progress? Well, this is what Isaiah writes in Isaiah 2, verses 2, well, verses 2 through 4. And again, remembering that it's a progressive, um, you know, basically uh, it's a progress that's going on. It's not something that comes necessarily suddenly, but this is what he says. Now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream into it. And many peoples will, will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. Now again, put that in a context that is after the return of Christ. It, it doesn't seem to make sense that um, you would have these nations and people coming from various places and the idea, uh, well, certainly universal peace makes sense, but it appears to be talking about a time when those distinctives are still here, that the mountain of the Lord or basically the Lord's kingdom is going to um, grow in its influence and exert this kind of peaceful influence over the world. Now, we see that again in the New Testament, as I've already mentioned, because Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 25, he must reign until all his enemies are, until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Jesus' reign begins at the ascension. Paul here is referencing Psalm 110, and he tells us that he will continue to reign until all of his enemies are conquered. So what does that look like? It looks like what we've just seen, peace, nations worshiping the Lord, desiring to learn his will, desiring to walk in his ways, uh, and to honor him. Now, again, we know this is going to happen, but the question is, when is this going to happen? We can't designate the day or the time. This is something, you know, date setting is something that has always failed in the church. But here, I think, is an important point. If this is going to happen, it's got to happen before Jesus returns, okay? Because, remember, when he returns, there's going to be a definitive end to life as we know it. Paul says in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. When all of Jesus' enemies are subdued under his feet, when basically all the, the nations are serving him and giving this feigned obedience to him, um, the last enemy that he comes to conquer is going to be death, and that's going to happen when he returns. So all of his enemies have to be conquered before he returns because he returns to raise them for the final judgment. All the other enemies are going to be subdued before that time. They're going to bow the knee before he returns, which is what we see from the Old Testament passages. Now, let me just submit to you that that's what Jesus is talking about in these parables as we get back to it. He says, the mustard seed is thrown into the garden and it grows into a great tree. And then he says, the birds of the air nested in its branches. Now, that's an interesting image. What, what does Jesus mean by that? Well, New Testament prophecy often borrows from Old Testament imagery. 
And in the Old Testament, we have this exact symbol being used in Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar uh, had this dream. And in this dream, there was this huge tree. And, you know, the, the beasts of the field were basically foraging under it, and the birds of the heavens were nesting in its branches. And when he related that dream, Daniel interpreted it, and he says, that tree, O king, refers to you and to your kingdom. And as far as all these animals that are basically uh, surrounding it, these are the nations, these are the kings who are coming under, the, under your kingdom and are seeking to be basically sustained and protected by this kingdom. Jesus is telling us in this parable that the same is going to be true of his kingdom. The other kingdoms of the earth are going to come to him for protection and for provision. The second parable tells us that the leaven of this kingdom, uh, or that the leaven of the kingdom, basically its power and its influence is going to work its way through the whole world until all of it is leavened or influenced by his rule. Now, if this is the case, okay, if, the, if this is actually true, then we should expect certain things to be fulfilled in Scripture. Psalm 2, for instance, uh, where the psalmist writes in verse 6, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain, referring to the exaltation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then after he is uh, installed as king, after he's coronated, then comes this warning to the kings of the earth in verses 10 through 12. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. So Jesus is basically installed as king and then all the kings of the earth are called upon to bow the knee to him, to kiss the Son, and if they don't, basically there are consequences. What this tells us is the great commission that Jesus has given to the church is one day actually going to be accomplished when he says in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Now, why did Jesus say that? Because these passages needed to be fulfilled, that all the kings and all the nations of the earth would serve the Lord. That, that's the reason why the Great Commission is ongoing. That's the reason why it was given, not just to save individuals, but to influence countries. You know, the kingdom of heaven is to have a greater influence than, than just, you know, the, the salvation of souls, which, of course, is very important. But as I've said, Jesus came to save and Jesus came to rule. The government is on his shoulders and all the kings of the earth are to submit to him. It basically tells us this, too, that the first two petitions of the Lord's Prayer are eventually going to be answered. Remember, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. By whom? by the entire world. May the entire world reverence your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, that's what Jesus taught us to pray. And the question is, is he going to fulfill that? And what is that going to look like? Now, remember when, um, when Jesus went out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil and the devil tempted him with the kingdoms of the world and he says, I'll give you all of these if you'll just bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, you know, be gone, Satan. It's, it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Well, obviously, Jesus is not going to be tempted by the enemy. But realize, too, that Jesus actually came into the world to receive those kingdoms as a part of his reward. But it wasn't going to come through worshiping the devil. It was going to come through serving his father and fulfilling the work that he gave him to do. Through that work, he would be exalted. And every knee would one day bow before him. One day, that is going to take place. One day, we are going to see it. Now, it may not happen in our day, but it is going to happen. Now, in closing, let me just, just apply this at least in one way. I think we need to understand that when Jesus sends us out to, with the Great Commission, armed with the gospel to tell other people about Jesus, that he has sent us out for a reason. And it's not, it's not necessarily, and it certainly isn't at all. What's that? It, where, where is it coming through? Oh, 
Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we, why don't we just bow for a moment of prayer and, and let's ask for the Lord's grace for whatever that particular need might be and then I'll conclude this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask for the, the, I think the Amber Alert has to do with children who are in danger. I remember seeing one on the way home yesterday from Presbytery. We do pray, Lord, for those who are um, involved in this. We pray that you would please protect the child in danger. And we also pray that you would please bring that person who is threatening the child to repentance and that uh, the, the authorities may find them um, and uh, bring them in uh, and that, again, the child would be protected and preserved. Lord, would you please grant your mercies and we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's get back to the application then. Okay, so when the Lord has told us to pray, uh, the petitions in the Lord's Prayer, and when he has sent us out to do the Great Commission, we need to realize that he didn't send us out on, on a fool's errand, and, and nobody really believes it would be totally of that case. Um, not just a few, I mean, well, okay, there are going to be relatively few who are saved, but um, it, those things are actually going to take place. I think sometimes we get the impression, especially uh, from certain views of uh, eschatology, that... Um, that we're, we're sort of trying to scale a mountain that is unscalable. You know, that we're just sort of picking away at something that we're really not going to put much of a dent in. Uh, I think if we understand it, what the Lord says the magnitude of the kingdom is going to be, that it gives to us an encouragement that we're not basically being ineffectual. It's, it's, it's kind of like, why should I even bother? Why should I try if, if the whole world is going to go down the tubes anyway? But if it's not going to go down the tubes... And if the Lord is going to establish his kingdom and there is going to be this influence, we're working towards something that is much greater. And I think that gives to us encouragement. So even though we, we may see a lot of opposition today, even though we may meet with a lot of opposition <clears throat> as we go out and do our best to share the gospel with others, we, we know the Lord is going to complete this work. We know that it's going to work towards fulfilling these things. And even though... The number of people who are going to be saved relative to the number of people in this world is always going to be the minority. Actually, we're going to see that um, next time, not this evening, but uh, next week. Um, there's still going to be many people, and eventually the Lord is going to work in a way that is more powerful perhaps than we, than we see now. I, sh I should um, mention this. If you haven't silenced your cell phones, now it might be a, a good time also to, to do that. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Okay. Um, we do know that um, the Lord has been working progressively, you know, through, through the years to advance his kingdom. There are those who believe it's going to continue at this pace, and there are others who believe that the Lord is going to do something very powerful and sudden to advance it as it spreads throughout the world. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, there were the outpourings of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And were there more people saved on the day of Pentecost than before the day of Pentecost? 3,000 from one sermon. And then after that, the 5,000, right? Well, what else has happened in the history of the, of the church? Uh, the Reformation. Uh, I'd say that was a very powerful time. A lot of people were converted. A lot of explosion of truth that brought people into the kingdom. Um, the Puritan era... Uh, the first and second great awakenings that took place in, in New England and in um, Old England, if we can put it that in, in those terms. Uh, and those who experienced those things were looking at these passages and saying, perhaps this is the beginning of, of this, um, this, these latter -day, this latter day glory that we've been reading about in Scripture. Uh, Jonathan Edwards and, and others in the, the Scottish church who also believe this, George Whitfield, they all preached with this kind of expectation. So they prayed and they asked that the Lord might bring that revival. And uh, the Lord did not answer in those days, but some believe that their prayers may have been what the Lord used to bring about the great missionary expansion that took place in the next century as the kingdom of heaven continued to expand through the world. But what they believed was that there would be a work of the Holy Spirit that would be even greater than these that have taken place before that would literally change the world almost overnight. That's exactly what happened in the, the Second Great Awakening, is that almost in a day, society changed. Uh, a lot of the, um, the youth stopped, you know, thinking about things that um, basically 
younger people would think about, and they began thinking more seriously about the kingdom of heaven. The pubs that people would go in to, to get drunk were, were becoming you know, closed, and they weren't being frequented anymore, and, and people began to come to Bible studies, and they began to uh, think more carefully about what was being said in church, and their lives were changed, and it, it kept up for several years that way. Now, Edwards looked at that, and he said, you know, this is from God, and if God could do it, you know, in these places for this period of time, he can certainly do it throughout the world, and that's what he expected to see. So whether it comes gradually or whether it comes more Suddenly, they believed it was going to come. Now, when these things come, not only does the Spirit save more people than normal, but He also subdues those who aren't Christians. During the Great Awakening, it looked almost like everybody was a Christian. Jonathan Edwards, during the first Great Awakening, it was his first revival that he had experienced, <clears throat> he, uh, he thought the Lord was saving virtually everybody in society because everybody was, was coming to church, everybody was interested in spiritual things. But when the revival ended uh, and he saw people go back to the way they were before, he realized that, okay, there were, there were more people saved, but there, these people he thought were saved were not really saved. So then he began thinking about, well, what is it that really distinguishes a believer from an unbeliever? And when the second Great Awakening came around, I think it was probably about, um, oh, what I don't want to say about five years later, uh, he was a little bit more cautious about whom he thought was converted and, and whom not. But it did change the people who weren't converted. It basically made them do what um, we've already read in the Psalms, that even his enemies will give feigned obedience. Even his enemies will bow the knee to him. So if in a revival like that took place, it would essentially subdue even his enemies' hearts. They would bow the knee. They would honor. They would obey him. And even wars would end, and there would be peace in the world, which is what we um, basically see happening here in the Scriptures. Now, some might object the book of Revelation. We don't have time, obviously, to get into that, but um, if it's true the book of Revelation is primarily dealing with 70 AD, it's not an obstacle. That's already taken place. Now, as far as the end, when Satan is released, Postmillennialists believe, uh, those that hold to this view that this happens before Jesus comes again, they believe Satan will be released. They believe there will be uh, basically a, a last um, uh, persecution against the church as Satan goes out to gather together all who belong to him when that which held him back is, is finally released. Now, when that happens and he attacks the church, it's only going to be for a brief period of time. And I believe that the reason why it takes place is because if you have a world full of people that are either converted or are subdued, you don't know who the believers are and who the unbelievers are, and then the day of judgment suddenly breaks in, and you've got all these really nice people suddenly being judged and many of them being cast into the lake of fire, you, you might wonder, why is, that gonna you know, why is that happening? But if the restraint is removed and you see what they're really like, and they're mobilized by Satan against the church, then when the Lord comes in His second coming and He brings His judgment, then it becomes clear you know, who belongs to Him and who doesn't belong to Him. I really think, too, that this view, it, it tends to make sense. Rather than just glorifying the Son in eternity, you know, uh, among us, as, well, still the whole audience of mankind, but just as judge on the, on the final day, it seems to make more sense that our Lord would so exalt his son in history by expanding his kingdom and by bringing about the things that, that we've seen. Uh, it, it, it's, it seems to me that it would bring more honor to him, particularly at, at this time uh, in the world. So these parables, I'll, let me just conclude by saying this, these parables encourage us that the kingdom is going to grow, that the kingdom is going to advance even through our efforts that it's going to overcome all opposition. We shouldn't let opposition stop us because something greater is yet to come. I think on anyone's view, some, something greater is coming. So we should let it encourage us. We need to take this encouragement with us. When we're, we're praying, we need to take that encouragement to the throne of God and pray that the Lord would fulfill these passages. When we're sharing the gospel with others, we should have some kind of expectation that the Lord is going to work through us and work through the gospel, and He is going to, you know, move us closer uh, and further in that direction. We shouldn't get discouraged. We shouldn't be pes pessimistic. Uh, 
have a defeatist kind of an attitude. We're not scaling an unclimbable mountain. Uh, we're doing what the Lord has called us to do, and He is going to use it to these glorious ends. So may the Lord encourage us uh, through these things. Let, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we, and ask the Lord to, um, to encourage us.